Welcome to my journey to Amsterdam. Two months ago, I wrote a total of three papers and all three got accepted. This is the first leg of this journey. I presented this work at the Practical Reservoir Monitoring Workshop. I'm going to experiment a bit with this format on this channel, sharing my scientific progress and making it more accessible to a wider audience. I will leave all the links in the doobly-doo below. If you have questions, please either leave a comment or write me an email, whichever you prefer. So, I just got done with my presentation. I think it's time to go out. Okay, it's really cool. I love Amsterdam, it's such a nice city and I don't know, it's kind of chill in the, when you're not here on the weekend. On the weekend it's cold. My hotel has the coolest key card. It's literally a punch card. Like, I've never seen this before. Like, look at it. It starts in seven hours again. And I need to sleep. But I'm done. Talk tomorrow. Bye. All right. Um, I'm here to complicate things. <laughs> First of all, we're gonna have a lot more parameters. Uh, we're gonna do AVO, but we're still gonna stay map-based. So, what we're talking about is deep learning. And I figured I'd give a introduction to deep learning here because some people may have only heard it as buzzword. And since AI, machine learning, deep learning, and that stuff is a huge buzzword, uh, I wanna mention, I'm not Google. So I know they do amazing work, but they're paid much better than me and a bit smarter. So the results here, I, I would say they're okay, but they're not magic. So don't expect too much. So after all that hedging, let's get to it. We're gonna work with the Shihalian data. I wanna motivate you with a bit of data before delving into, into neural networks. Then right into the results we get out of our neural network, and then Google. compare the entire thing to a Bayesian inversion that uh, my co-author, Gustavo Corte has made and some conclusions. So fairly straightforward, but we also only have 20 minutes. So this is the data. We have near mid and far stacks. This is uh, delta amplitudes between the 2004 um, time step and the base. So in this, you can see that we only have a uh, hardening and softening um, labeled, but that should be enough to understand it. And um, we have some interesting things going on, but I'd like to discuss them a bit later when we actually look at our inversion results. So you see, this is real data. I mean, the Shihalian sandstone, it's basically five to 30 meters thick. So this entire map has been extracted from one trough in the seismic. We trained our algorithm on synthetics only. It has never seen real data before. And you might guess how that goes because real data is really noisy and synthetic data is really, really nice and smooth. Ready for some neural networks? <laughs> <laughs> this is the simplest form of a neural network. We have two inputs over here. We have a neuron and we have an output. So if we, if we look into our neural network, there's something happening there. So our inputs get usually just added together, and then we have some kind of function that makes it nonlinear. I mean, this is the simplest form of nonlinearity where everything below zero is zero, and every point above stays the same. But it's nonlinear, and that helps us in neural networks a lot because that way you can capture nonlinearities in your data. Now, we just add more neurons in one layer. That means we can also have more inputs and we have more information. This is the one layer neural network. We can also go deeper and deeper. And that's deep learning. It's essentially adding layers to your neural network. That's the magic. It's just more information flow and more like final non-linearities that can be caught in these deeper networks. Now, if you want the smart intro to deep learning, we'll just add some structure to it. You see that 
On the left here, we have something we call an encoder. Basically, it goes down like a funnel. In the middle, we have a compression layer, and then we go out to a decoder. That means our neural network is forced to learn a low dimensional representation of the data. A lot of the neural networks these days work in this way, that they go down, compress your data to a latent dimension, and then go out to, to transform it to something else. And if we look at our inversion, basically, we want to go down from our seismic and go out to our inversion result. So that's why I basically decided on, a, on an architecture like this. The plan? Simulate our seismic from pressure water saturation that we get out of our eclipse simulator. Then we train our network to invert simulated seismic. And then we transfer the network to the observed seismic. And obviously, this part is tricky. It's tricky because seismic data can be really ugly. I mean, this is nice seismic data, don't get me wrong, but seismic data just, it's physical data. We have a lot of noise that comes from everything. I mean, every one of you has looked at seismic data and thought, this could be nicer, but this works. We feed this into our encoder decoder. This is essentially the neural network we're working with from before. The orange going in, the compression layer, and the decoder going out. In the middle, I'm using a little trick. Those of you who remember mu is our mean, and sigma is our variance. Basically, we're learning a nice Gaussian in the middle. So we have a distribution over our data. That means we can all already take noisy data and get cleaner output data because our neural network takes the noisy input, does whatever a neural network does, captures the nonlinearities, and then assigns it to these Gaussians in the middle. That just gives it a bit more variability. <laughs> our inputs are near mid far and poor volume because um, having some structural information is really important, as it turns out. Like, I could barely make it work without the poor volume, but it just works so much better if you have some kind of structural guidance in there. The output is going to be the change in pressure, the change in water saturation, and the change in gas saturation. So I've been lying a little bit. We're not just doing pressure saturation inversion. We're also inverting for water and for gas. Because I'm using a bit of a trick in our, our learning, um, we have to constrain it a little. And that's why I um, came up with a solution. Just use the gradient, but use it in the neural network structure. So during training, we, con we always calculate the gradient of our input data. And since the trick to make your neural network learn noisy data is to just add noise to your data every iteration. So neural networks learn in a lot of iterations. And in every iteration, we're adding new noise to our data and calculating the gradient of that. Uh, we'll basically say we have a gradient that is going up, but it should actually be a gradient going down and still assign the right value. But that is giving us some tolerance in our seismic noisy data because nowhere in this neural network are we using the context. So we are only looking at each sample not at adjacent samples. We do not have any calculation in there that is going and saying, oh, look at the surrounding pixels to make our solution more stable. And this is why I chose this kind of neural network, like a dense neural network, we call it, because then we can see if we're actually producing anything useful here. This is our neural network output. Our water saturation, and I'm, I'm going to compare it to different things later. But standing for itself, we can see from this standalone, you can see that there is consistency in the map. So there is some noise, but you see patches that belong together. Although the neural network does not have information from the surrounding map points. The question came up, um, our neural network only learns things that we show it. It can't do anything outside. The interesting part is a decrease in gas saturation. We never at any point had a decrease in gas saturation in our training data. Now, this may be a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, there's clearly risk with this because if you have out of training 
learning. That means theoretically it's possible to learn something wrong. But this also shows that we can learn relationships in our data structures that are not explicitly present in our training data. So we are working with synthetic data. We do not have a decrease in gas saturation in the training set and still our neural network is interpreting that here. If that's right or wrong, that's another discussion. Looking at the simulation and the inversion results. We have an increase in pressure over here. What's troubling is that we see some pressure increase and don't see it in the simulator. Now, the big blob of water down here is not represented here, but we do see some of the waterfronts like this one. It isn't as coherent as the simulator, but then again, I'm, I'm not sure if it would be with any non-Bayesian inversion. And down here, we have a big blob that also appears here. So it looks quite nice, but a couple of things are really problematic. On itself, this actually doesn't look so good. But if we actually compare it to a Bayesian inversion, so an inversion result, not just the, the simulator, it looks very different. Down here, this point that I just mentioned, change. You can see that in the Bayesian inversion, you actually see some pressure up here as well and much less gassing out going on. And in the water region, well, same, but this part is still, this should have been captured better in here. So some of the gassing out should have probably gone, gone over over here. So the results are clearly correlated. And this part here, it looks wrong because from the simulator we know that this should be a pressure up and there should be water injection here. But the water injection is happening because there's gas. So one possible interpretation or explanation of what the neural network is doing here is actually uh, putting some gas back into solution, but the water here should be much better. So this is also something that I'm trying to get at. Neural networks give you an answer, but not the answer. So this is still something that has to be interpreted. You have to make sense of it as with any other method. But it is quite powerful in extracting information that is raw from the data without using a strong prior. Because so the, um, the critique I've heard about the Bayesian inversion is that it looks too much like the, oh, sorry, like the simulation. And I mean, it does because at some of the points where the uncertainty is too high, you change and you take more information from the prior. So what you see here is basically two boundaries that, that you can work between. So this is very, very data dependent. And this is with a stronger prior from the simulation result. Now, one thing that I forgot, to mention about the, does our neural network actually give us data that matters? You may see that I just put one, one color scale up here, well, for, for each of the, of the maps. That is because the values are the same and I did not clip them. The output of our neural network is unconstrained. It could be anywhere from minus infinity to positive infinity and it does get the value range right without me telling it, oh, you have to be there. It's learning this relationship that it should actually be at that point. So we have coherence and we have the values in the right kind of, well, range. So these are all points that I, I think point in a good direction for this kind of approach as well. Um, and of course, it's massively fast after training you can use this neural network and just rerun it again and it's done in a couple of seconds. So inverting in the entire map, I think it took five seconds on my computer. You can do it on CPU, maybe it takes 30 seconds then. Though, of course, the training still takes a couple of hours. Training neural networks is expensive, but then you have an out-of-the-box neural network 
that you can just plug in and reuse. Conclusions, although I've basically already concluded a lot. Neural networks with their AVO formulation are more stable than without, and we get more inversion results in the right direction than without, and our noise is more stable. So the AVO in there, the physical information, it matters, turns out. We were actually doing really good without neural networks, and neural networks can be another tool that we can now weave into what we already know. Training on simulation data can be transferred to observe data. And this is quite interesting, I think, because you can simulate a lot, but you can only shoot so much seismic. And also, you don't have ground truth for your seismic. Meaningful relationships are learned. I mean, you see the blobs are in the right direction. There's some errors. Clearly, there's room for improvement. I'm not, not saying this is perfect, but we have the right range and we have good looking blobs. Turns out gas saturation is actually a really hard problem. <laughs> um, I'm just going to leave it like that because, yeah, it is. Um, Bayesian and neural inversion both give valuable insights, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily choose one over the other, but I would definitely say both give very important information for interpreting these maps. And <laughs> machine learning talks will always end on, well, we have to do, have more data, <laughs> longer training, and yeah, but the next step might be to use convolutional neural networks that actually look in the vicinity of each point because then you have context around your center pixel and it, it learns more relationships that are around your point. So it just leaves me to thank all the sponsors of ETLP on the right, Linda Hodgson and Ross Walder especially because they helped us. Uh, Google for the TensorFlow, NumFocus for everything Python, um, my center, the DHRTC, and ETLP for having me, of course. And uh, if you would like to learn more, we're going to be at the UAD. I suppose you know a bit about recommended systems having made it to the end. So let the algorithm know you liked it. And share it with a friend. See you next time.